Hello, BBT. Welcome back to another episode of After Hours with Traders. Uh, of course, it won't be an episode if we're not with Profit of Profit. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you, and uh, Happy New Year to everybody. I know we're, <clears throat> we're recording this on December 31st, New Year's Eve, but uh, uh, I'm sure you'll be watching it in the new year, and we're all looking forward to that. Exactly. We're already in drinking mode. There's yeah. alcohol in this. <laughs> and of course, our uh, guest, our fearless leader, Andrew. Hey, Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you for watching. Thank you for following us in 2021. Uh, it went by really fast, but uh, we made it. And uh, yeah, I wish uh, happiness and success in 2022 for everyone. Yeah. yeah. So if you're new to the show, this is a show that where every week we come on and we talk about major events that happen uh, during that week. We talk about the market, the macros, the, you know, the ins and outs, uh, important events. We review Twitter. So we have a full on packed show this week as well. We're going to talk about the market in general. How did the market close? We're going to talk about some of our best trades, some of our worst, worst trades for the years uh, and uh, some prediction going into the next year. So. Uh, without kind of further ado, let's talk about markets. We closed the markets. Uh, SPY, S&P 500 closed at 27%. Uh, another year of double digit growth, remarkable. Dow, 18%. Russell 2000, um, the small caps lagged at only about 13, uh, 13.5%. And technology at about 27% as well. Any surprises, gentlemen? I think the Russell uh, 2000, the reason that it lagged 13% is because last year he had a monster move. So when you look at the two years, I don't know exactly the numbers, maybe this is something we can look into that, but Russell actually was leading all of them uh, in, 2020, uh, in 2020 after recovery from the pandemic. Uh, but other, you know, the Dow Jones is interesting, 18%. These are all the value companies. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the, the, I guess I would want to call it a surprise, but the, you know, the, just the strength in the markets, just the, that, that amount of return you just don't expect to see in one year. And, uh, you know, of course, it, a lot of it had to do with the Fed and all the, the money that was pumped into the system. Yeah. And uh, we will talk about that a little bit more later. But uh, yeah, it was, I think it took, I think the returns actually took a lot of people by surprise from, from uh, for the SPY and the, and the Dow and the, the Qs. But, so do you think the economy is not 30% or 25%? Bigger compared to the last year. I, th I think the I think the uh, you know I think we're everybody's talking about how the market is pretty well fully valued here. Um, you know, the, we got into this uh, issue with Tina, which is the there is no other alternative for money, and really that's that's what it was. I mean, people were putting money in the stock market because you know if you had money in bonds or treasuries, you, you know you're basically losing money after uh, inflation. So. You know where where are you going to put money? You know money went into real estate obviously as well. A lot of the markets have been pretty hot in real estate, but uh, stocks was another obvious uh, uh, place for money to go, and that's what we saw. Yeah, and especially U.S. economy, right? Because uh, from the way they handle pandemic and and just the robustness of the growth and recovery makes sense. I think yeah, I think earnings in on average grew about twenty percent. Uh, yeah, I had uh, one of my friends, uh, his wife was working in uh, Aritzia, which is a uh, women's branding cloth. It's public. And yeah. It's a public company. Yeah, yeah, Aritzia, it's yeah. a Canadian and company. he said that uh, during the Christmas time, they had they hit a high record of $100,000 a day, which was significantly higher than last year's same time. Yeah. yeah. So the earnings are growing. And I can see even in Vancouver, it's just everything is busier, even though it's still not a lot of international travel. So. It does not surprise me very much that yeah. SPY is like 25% up yeah. through the high. Yeah. So th the question is, is there a bubble <laughs> that we're going to burst or not? I don't, see it. I don't see it coming, at least in the short term. I mean, there's just a lot of money floating around in the system. And um, it's just, uh, you know, people talking about a recession, but, you know, they're saying probably not next year. Yeah. I mean, so I, I still think the economy is robust. There's a lot of people, and, and to your point, there's a lot of people out there that have a ton of money. Um, they haven't been spending it on travel, you know. That's true. Uh, so there's people out there, and they want to spend. And uh, and the, really, the problem is the shortage of uh, of goods right now. You know, there's just a lot of money. Yeah, and, and at, you know, the very low unemployment, yeah. and everyone, even at least in Vancouver that I'm living, everyone is looking for. Uh, someone to hire. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's uh, hiring is a challenge, not just in Vancouver, but everywhere. I mean, 
there's a there's a shortage of labor and and you know there's there's a lot of talk about the you know the the labor shortage and and how people are not participating in the in the market in the labor market they're not going back to work and yeah. so yeah it's it's an interesting there's a lot of interesting dynamics that are going on now that will continue into 2022 for sure yeah it'll be very interesting so unemployment is an interesting one because although unemployment is coming down but so does the participation rate so people are not actively looking for a job so that's it's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic so it could be some of it could be because of the wealth effect People, they're, they're retiring earlier because they're... SMP yeah, that's what I heard that uh, people are starting early at 55 because yeah. now their portfolio and 401ks are so good so, that they don't need to work. But if this bubble bursts, if it's a bubble, yeah. and then people might go back in there. But I'm sure the data must be, people who are 55, 60, I don't know how they can impact them employment in that data. I don't know, actually. So um, if you're working... 65 or 65 or under or you're looking for a job they um, consider you, you consider you yeah. as the labor force yeah and then the unemployment is just how many people yeah it's very interesting so we know the indices had a really strong year but let's go to our traders and see how their year was uh, i would love to know your guys's best trade for the year and worst trade for the year because i think there's a lot of learning not only in the best trades but also in the worst trades uh, Andrew, I, I don't you. know about my best trade, but my worst trade was you, the <laughs> car. You know that. Yeah, yeah. I just started the car, the, the car Hertz company. I don't. And it's not Hertz. It's the Avius. I Avius, think. Yeah, yeah, Avius, yeah. Avius and the budget, I think. So yeah. it was squeezing up, and uh, maybe we can put a chart in there. People can see it was just a monster move, and I started shorting it a little bit too early, and I just kept adding on it, and eventually I had to accept a very heavy loss on it. Eventually, I made it back. But it was a very, very tough uh, trade for me. And it was a little bit uh, embarrassing because that's the type of thing you do as a beginner trader, not as someone who has seven, eight years of trading under your belt because they are very, very dangerous. So, and my question is, and I think a lot of the audience will have this question as well. Was, it, was your thinking okay and the trade didn't work out? Like what made it a bad trade? Was your analysis behind it wrong? Like what was the element? That's a very good question. Uh, I don't have a trade book for these parabolic reversals. Mm. So I do not have a specific entry and exit. Eamon has. Eamon knows exactly, they say when the one minute chart is this a standard deviation and ball. He has a very defined entry. I look at the charts, oh, they're, they're high and then they should go down. And most of the time works, but you know, there are one time that it doesn't work. So the, the worst part was I did not have a good entry point. I mean, you have a good entry point, you don't have a stop loss. You go up, you add a little bit more. Uh, and yeah, that, was, that, was, that makes it worse. A trade without a trade book, essentially a gamble. So without a plan, yeah. Without a plan. Trade book, or a trade without a plan, yeah. Yeah. Brian, to you. No, you, you want to talk about my read? <laughs> let's, let's start with the best trade. Yeah. Let's try. Uh, you know, I had a lot of good trades. I mean, uh, sometimes it's a little lucky, but I, I mean, I, I can't think of a specific trade that I would say was a really good trade. Um, I have a couple that stood out, maybe FedEx. I picked the bottom on that one recently. And, um, you know, some of the, um, when in the summer when some of the uh, low floats were really hot, uh, you know, I managed to, to trade a few of those and make some some really good money just just purely momentum trading so amazing yeah so i'm yeah. sure you're going to want to ask about my worst trade so yeah it uh, there's it easily comes to mind this is uh, a stock i've been in for quite a quite a while now actually probably from before uh 2021 it's uh it's a stock called Willow. It's on the Toronto Stock Exchange. I'm I'm uh, what they call a bag holder on that one. <laughs> we all have. All of us are having that. Yeah. The bag holding, for those of you who don't know what the term is, is you're buying something and you don't accept the loss and you want to sit on it until it comes back. That's called bag holding. And yeah. we all have it. I have a TNA in my position right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Brian has one yeah. big position. Yeah, big position. And, um, and you know, when my thesis was, you know, the, at the time the pot stocks were hot and it and it went up like I was up 25, 30 percent on it uh, at one point, and I kept thinking, okay, uh, I uh, I'm getting out at you know when it gets to four dollars. Yeah. Well, now it's at you know it's at 40 cents now. So <laughs> you know. Yeah. Do you so, have an exit plan for it? Uh, 
Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm hanging with it until I die. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, uh, <laughs> that's a funny point. Yeah, one of my friends, uh, I mean, I mentioned that in the chat. He he's a really good friend of me, and uh, he has ninety thousand dollars worth of a stock called Mile, which the ticker is Mile, M I L E. Yeah. And the idea is insurance per drive. So you, why would you pay too much insurance? Everyone pays insurance based on how much they drive. It's a nice idea. And Chamat is behind it. Yeah. yeah. So his average is at like. 10 or 15 yeah. and since summer that he told us Adi and I every morning look at it and right now it's under two dollars <laughs> so yeah. every morning is just coming down yeah. he said you know what I'm a bank holder on that yeah. all the way to the end <laughs> it's funny because I think at some point it doesn't make any more sense to exit like once you're down 95 percent what do you like? One thing that you can do is uh, we discussed that you can write covered calls on it yeah. and you can make some money that's what Adi and I are doing on my TNA position is at 30,000 shares, so you can sell 300 contracts every week and potentially you can make you know, 10% yeah. a year on your losing position. That's what we calculated, you're yeah. making 10% return on that. Well, I wish I could do that with Willow, but it's not. Uh, yeah. It's not, it's not yeah. Yeah. But you know, I mean, Willow, I, I was just telling Andrew and uh, already before, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy because uh, Willow's up 10% in the last two days, so. You went up four cents. Yeah, went up Speaking of not options, uh, can, uh, Warren Buffett says that people should only trade indexes or invest in indexes. Yeah. Because indexes are liquid, there's always options on them, SPY, QQQ, and stuff. And usually it's hard to beat the market as, as a swing traders are investing. Uh, how was the, the return of hedge funds this year? Uh, compared to the market. Is the report out yet? Glad you asked. Very interesting. So yeah, yeah, uh, at least some of them report. So one thing to note about hedge funds is the majority of them are self-reporting. So these numbers that we got here actually could be even worse. But only three of the hedge funds that reported were able to beat S&P for the year. Which one were they? Uh, they were mostly long and short equity in terms of a strategy. So they were finding, like, fundamentally finding a stocks, uh, Senvance, Impla, and SRS. What were the return? Uh, 75%, 55%, and 46%. And then the other just followed the pack. So in terms of worse ones, of course, Melvin Capital. GME short to squeeze. The yeah. best uh, event oh of God. 2021, yeah. which, uh, you know, you probably know that, that uh, uh, Wall Street bet uh, Reddit. Yeah. They started squeezing Melvin Capital. Did you know that the Wall Street bet is not out anymore? They shut it down. The page? The, the, yeah, it's not a forum in Reddit anymore. Oh, really? With yeah. 8 million people? Yeah, we, we actually looked it up today because, we, yeah, we, there, there's, it's not out anymore. Oh, hmm. wow. They shut it down with 9 million or 10 wow. million users. That's and Reddit's insane. going uh, public this Reddit year. Reddit's going, going public. public. And that's well. surprising because they would. Uh, you know, with that many users in that one, just in that one forum, you'd yeah. think that would be a big yeah, monetary driver for them. And uh, yeah, yeah. So, anyways, uh, there are other started other forums, but that particular ones they shut it down, and that's why Melvin Capital it, Capital is minus 41 percent. What's the percent? Yeah, yeah forty two percent in there so they, because of the short they, they, they lost half of investors' money. Yeah. And they're charging 2% uh, managing fee on top of that. Yeah. But some of the more interesting ones out of this was Renaissance, as an example. The, the major quant, quant shop with Jim Simon, which is, which is a legendary mm -hmm. uh, mathematician. He only returned 11%. So what quant, you mean that they have alg high frequency algorithms? Algorithm, quantitative base. Uh, That's a trading. famous one? Yeah, Jim Simon Renaissance is, 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 is a really, really famous one. It's basically the seller. His medallion funds has been beating the market for a really long time, mm -hmm. which makes it, makes it, has the market change? Makes it, you mm -hmm. know, because these quants are all based on a statistic model based on past, right? Great. And like we talked about how much there's a lot more option volume in the market right now a lot more retail trading uh, going on. Has the market changed? Is that why a lot of the quant shop, so we'll put the, we'll put the return of the hedge fund somewhere in the screen so you can actually see, but is that why the quant shops are underperforming? I don't know. I mean, uh, when the market is not very volatile, I think these quants are probably can beat us because you know they have all the data and the commissions are low. They're pretty much essentially paying no commission or no ECM fee. But when something like GME short to squeeze happens, or Chinese companies like Baba going down or up like that, what do they want to do? It's just the volatility of this market can be unpredictable in these certain situations. 
Well, I certainly know in the last um, last month or so, and, um, I can't say that this has been going on for a, the whole year, but certainly in the last month I've noticed that the, the money rotating, like we talk about rotation of capital, it's and it's just been, it's been back and forth and back and forth. One minute, you know, we've got, uh, you know, money rotating into utilities and, and consumer defensives. Yeah. You know, the next day it's technology and, and consumer discretionary yeah. and utilities are on the bottom. So I just, the money is just rotating back and forth. Yeah. So, you know, depending on what their algorithms are trading on, I mean, if they're chasing that, you know, they're, every time they try to flip there, you know, it goes the other way, so. Yeah. Um, it was yeah. really hard to guess the sentiment of the market. They usually say it takes about eight years for the business cycle. It seemed like we were going through business cycles yeah. every, every two months. Yeah, every two months, okay. because people yeah. want to find a strong sector, just pop up, they, they yeah. just want to follow this this pack. And one, uh, one thing, there, I've, I've, I watched, the, <clears throat> I saw a couple of tweets that they were saying that most of the return even the whole market comes from the FANG companies, the five companies. Is that really the case? Like there, is, there, is, there is certainly that going on right now. I mean, if you look at, we, we've been looking at some of the market internals. There's a lot of stocks that are trading below their 50 and 200 day moving yeah. averages. But you look at, um, you know, you look at stocks like Apple and Facebook. I mean, they're the, they're the ones that have been the performers and that yeah. are really carrying the market higher alphabet so there you go and it is market cap weighted so you know apple yeah. being like 10 the fang being like 25 percent of the market they're going to carry a lot of the weight so uh it's it's interesting yeah, yeah very very interesting uh, so you know speaking of returns markets and we're obviously finishing the year 2021 going into 2022 so i have some few questions i think a lot of our viewers will appreciate as well what was the biggest trading lesson you guys learned from 2021 that you could share with the audience. Trading lessons? Yeah. Oh, it could be personal. <laughs> but I mean, for me, it's just not averaging down on a losing position. As I mentioned, that car trade was, I was just crucified uh, in that time. Money, obviously, in one trade, I lost like almost $300,000, which is a lot of money. But more than that, it's just for me, it was more an embarrassment that it's because it was live in front of everyone. Yeah. And do not average down on a losing position. I mean, we talk about back holding and holding and laughed a little bit about it, but it's not fun to back hold something, you know, for a long time in your account. Yeah. I mean, I'm only back holding TNA because it's an index. It's 2,000 companies. But if it was like one single company, like Mile <laughs> or Willow, or Willow, <laughs> or Willow. These, these easily can go down. And you know, yeah. you should definitely, when you enter a trade, it's either a day trade or swing trade. Why am I getting in there? Which means defines your entry. And why, when am I getting out? Yeah. Either with the loss or profit. That's a very, very important question. It, it sounds very you know, simple, but a lot of people will ignore that. Uh, that's what I learned trading-wise. Uh, Personal-wise, I went to Africa for an extreme ultra-marathon race. Yeah. And I was thinking I'm in good shape. I mean, I knew I'm not the perfect shape, right. but I thought I'm, I'm a pretty healthy, you know, active guy. And I saw a lot of people way active, more active than more fitter than me. And it just kind of hit me that, okay, you know, I gotta, I gotta be careful a little bit more with my diet, with my, you know, beer, with my, you know, activity that as, as I age, I gotta be a little bit more uh, healthy. And that's the lesson that I want to get. Were they younger or older than you? They were, oh, they were older. The, oh, wow. the, the guy, Tom, Tom, Tom Owens, he was from Scotland. He did run. He was a great guy. He was 40. And I finished the race in 21 hours almost. He finished in 10 hours. Oh, wow. and, uh, unbelievable. In that heat and that elevation gain and that mileage is just unbelievable. It means that and he was older than me, three years. So it means that you can do it. You just have to make sure that you take care of your body. body yeah. And I was reading something recently that every food that you're eating, you're either fighting a disease or you are uh, yeah. you know, creating it. So it's very important what you eat. And you know, that's, that's my goal, the personal growth. Of, you know. Good. Take care of your body. Taking yeah. care of the Be body. Healthy. Yeah. Be healthy. And yeah. I try to do more um, ma marathons. There's one uh, in March in uh, Morocco. It's called Marathon de Sable, which is uh, seven days in, uh, uh, in the desert. I want to run that. Yeah. And then hopefully if I can make it uh, Everest, I want to plan to go summit Everest this year. It's usually April and May. Wow. See how it goes and how I feel. Um, yeah, and just continue climbing big mountains and running around the world. Sure. So, should I take you off the cigar list for yeah, 20 yeah. minutes? <laughs> Can I do it tonight? <laughs> I'm, just, uh, <laughs> I'm joking. So, for Andrew, trading was having a trade book and personal eating healthier. 
uh, you know, taking care of his body. Brian, would love to hear yours. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I could almost echo um, Andrew. I mean, uh, this this trade I did with Will. I mean, it, you know, I, I still have a lot of confidence in it. I think it's. In the long term, I think it's still a good uh, a good trade. That's why I'm sticking with it. But uh, you know, if I'd have really been following a trade, my, you know, if I'd have had a trading plan rather than just you know uh, basing it on hope or um, or my my expectation, if I'd had a trading plan, I wouldn't be in the trade now, or I would be in it yeah. now at a much lower price. Um, but that's probably again, that's you know, I broke a rule, and now I'm sitting waiting for it to go back up, and it's probably going to be a while but I'll, I'll, I'll wait on it and if it you know we'll see what happens but that's probably my uh, again as traders we're always learning we're always fighting um, you know we're always fighting these um, these demons that want to uh, take us away from our, tra our what we know is uh, doing doing the right thing having a trading plan and following yeah. it so um, did yeah. you get into any NFTs no um, no NFTs yet but uh, mm -hmm. did you? <laughs> I don't. I don't still understand it. That you're buying a JPEG file and you pay so much money for it. Uh, Nikki is laughing at <laughs> our producer is laughing. At you having a problem? He's, 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 he's in the NFT. <laughs> yeah. So what the what the hell is this? You're buying a J, JPEG file. I understand the non fungible token for you know the you know cyber copyright or cyber security and you know the you know thing. But buying and selling these. JPEG I, files? I, I don't really understand. I, I was listening to something on, the, on, I think it was CNBC last night about how um, somebody had just spent two and a half million dollars on some virtual space. <laughs> and, 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 I'm yeah. Yeah, and I'm thinking, you know, I mean, like, you know, when you buy, when you buy a lot in a city, you know, you, you, they're not just making lots every day, right? It's you know, limited. It's yeah. limited. You, you know, if you're going to buy a lot in Vancouver, yeah. that's, you know, they're, they're, you can't just make more lots. But, we, you know, it just seems to me like, you know, anybody can go create a space in the virtual world. And, and, and I think... And yeah, and unlimited space. Are we behind? I mean, I don't, I don't, don't, are we missing something at the <laughs> new generations? Is, I feel is like generation <laughs> Z or... Uh, they they um, see because I don't want to still see any. One of my friends actually messaged me, and she said you should buy something in metaverse, <laughs> and she was serious. R why? <laughs> but you know, but a lot of these, a lot of big companies are taking it seriously. Yeah. I mean, you've got Nike, Nike that are yeah. um, you know selling virtual shoes. You know, if you want to, if you're in the metaverse and you don't want to look good, you want to wear shoes, yeah. Nike shoes. Of course, right now when you go in the metaverse, you don't have. You don't have legs. Yeah. You can't just you can't just create one and put a logo in there. They want to come and is it seriously they want to sue I, you for copyright I infringement? Don't know how they're gonna, yeah, I don't know how they're going to. I mean, but, but I would love to hear about what people think in YouTube. You can comment on it. Maybe you're missing something. Yeah. Yeah. You know that seriously, in metaverse they're going to enforce copyright infringement. I do like the aspect of for artists. Like if an artist creates, you know, a, a something, and and they sell it to somebody and they get five dollars, but then the person turns around and sells it for twenty five dollars, then if the NFTs allows allows the original artist to benefit from that yeah. future yeah. future gain. Turn, like you yeah. think of you know Picasso if he could have had that at the time, or you know. Um, yeah. Some of the other famous artists of uh, the Renaissance. I mean, they all they all died starving and poor, yeah. and now their paintings are worth you know millions, millions. and millions and millions. So yeah. it allows artists to, to to get a benefit from the future value. Just, uh, sorry. Yeah, so I think I, I don't know. Gary V is a huge advocate of NFTs, and he says something really interesting. And he says, you know, it's the same thing like a blue check on an Instagram or a Twitter account. It's the same thing, but on, on you know, you would think that people shouldn't really care as much for a blue check, but they do. It brings that credibility, so it's kind of the same thing in NFT. So if someone, so for example, I purchase an NFT of a of a cat, and if someone copies in the internet, do I get a notification? I don't know how it works because apparently this token. How do you, how do they know that they, they, this is, has been transferred? Well, I think it's a unique. It's yeah. a it is a unique image. So um, you know, I guess they, in theory, someone could just take your image and copy it, but it wouldn't be the same image as the original one because it would has a different we want to call it's it recorded, serial number. Yeah, it's recorded Very, on the blockchain. Yeah, yeah, so it's recorded on the blockchain, so that we know that yours was the original because of the because of the blockchain. Because right now, the photographers that if they have a 
photograph and post it online and someone take a screenshot or download yeah. and save it, yeah, yeah. they have no way of finding it. But if through NFT, they can track this token and see who's actually using it in which website or in which art, then they can claim the copyright. Okay, this is, this is mine. But maybe I should learn, learn exactly how the NFTs yeah. work if you can track the token. Uh, very this. Uh, it would be very interesting. Like, think of it as concert tickets, game tickets. They could all be NFTs. So yeah, yeah, you know, we wanted yeah. to go to the LA Lakers game, yeah, and we yeah. were worried about, hey, is this ticket real or yeah, fake? Yeah. If it's yeah. NFT, you know yeah. it's... Yeah, you know. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's a very interesting yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be very interesting. It's a, yeah, it's an interesting... You know, part of it feels like a, a pyramid scheme. <laughs> you know, and, you know, you mentioned Gary V. Um, you know, uh -oh. A lot of big people, being, uh, being behind something doesn't necessarily should no. justify that something is true. I mean, there's a lot of... Uh, you know, questions that I think in the new life you have to ask yourself that is that really, I mean, the cryptocurrency, we discussed that before, that a lot of these cryptocurrencies are coming just, just because it's a cryptocurrency, that doesn't mean that you should put money in there. or The stable coin right there. now, they're saying it's the biggest Ponzi scheme, the stable coin, stable. they don't have enough dollar to back up, back the, back the stable coins they're saying. Yeah, it's, mm. it's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. But they were supposed to have it back through. It's US supposed dollar, to yeah. be backed by U.S. dollars, but they're saying they haven't. They they can't find that many U.S. dollars because they're selling so many stable coins. Wow, definitely is uh, very interesting to see yeah. how this one evolves. It's a new yeah. friend, new frontier. Yeah, new frontier. but I think that's a good point, Andrew. Critical thinking is really important. Asking the right questions. Yeah, always. Sure. I mean, anything that I see, especially in the day, in these days that your your tweet your tweet comes up, you don't know if where this information comes at. The first thing that I think we should do is just critical questions. Really, should I Google it myself or no? Should I just accept it as it is? And yeah. you know, that's I think very very important. And it's getting more difficult because more and more information comes from social media and from limited resources. I mean, in the past we we went through the encyclopedia, Wikipedia, Google. But I find myself less and less Google, and more information comes through social media yeah. to me yeah. without really double checking double it. Double checking it, yeah, exactly. So on the topic of trading. What are some of some of the advice you guys might have for someone who just started out trading? Um, I think uh, for traders, this is something that we always mention that you need uh, three elements. You need the right technology, you need the strategy, and you need the psychology for trading. And it doesn't matter what you trade. You either NFT trade or crypto or stock market or mini futures or options. You need the right technology for it. It could be from the app all the way to the sophisticated you know, computers or quants uh, that you have. Uh, so technology is very important, and knowing how to use it is also very important. I mean, I see these cameras that uh, Nikki brought for us, and I have a DSLR as well, but I don't know how to use it, and there's no value of spending $2,000 on something that you don't know how to actually use that. So uh, it's very important to know your technology. And then a strategy, okay, what is my strategy? Uh, obviously, just buying and sitting back holding on it is not a strategy. And of course, having the right mindset in trading and all of them together has to go into your trading plan, which we call a trade book. People have different names for it, like playbook or you know, trade bill or whatever that you want to call it, it, you have to in there. So try to think about it very uh, systematically that am I going to be a trader? Yes. What am I going to trade? And do I have these three elements and p package it all together? Very, very important to educate yourself and uh, yeah, just uh, definitely go with the simulator a little bit to see. It looks really easy, it's deceptively uh, easy, but it's not very easy. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah, yeah no, I, I, I basically would just echo what uh, Andrew has said. Um, I think uh, the important aspect uh, is just to continue to have a trading plan is uh, when you get into a trade, you know, know, know where you're gonna take some profits and uh, know where you're going to stop out when the um, when the when the trade goes the way uh, the wrong way. So that's probably the most uh, probably one of the most important elements of trading. And uh, yeah, so yeah, very nice. For myself, if I if I could give advice to anyone starting out, I think really understand the market regimes and when market regimes change, because one strategy could work in a certain regime of the market, but it wouldn't necessarily work. So just be aware that market is constantly changing. Like we talked about in 2020, buy every SPAC. Once the deal is announced, you're making a lot of money. 
2021, that strategy is not working anymore. Like I'm back holding a SPAC myself, right? Because Which one, IPOF? IPOF, yeah. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the deal to be announced, but, <laughs> but really be aware of that market regime. That's the most important one. So SPACs one. were the thing for 2020. Yeah. In 2021, they, they were they not were the thing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, there's still some coming out. You still see IPOs for them, but they're certainly not uh, as they're not hot popping anymore. Hot. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, like DVAC popped a lot, uh, Trump suspect. Mm -hmm. But other than that, everything else was, uh, was, yeah. Yeah. It was a little bit of a dud. So, kind of transitioning now into next year, I would love to play a game called Over Under, where I give you a scenario for next year. And would love to know if you think it's going to be over or under. Have you played over under mm -hmm. before? Have you played over under before? Yeah, uh, you, you explained that to me a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of a prediction going into next year, and hopefully next year we'll look at look back at this uh, prediction and see who was right and who was wrong. Uh, Spy, do you think we'll have another double digit um, year or no? So over ten percent or under ten percent? Brian I'm going to say uh, over, but I, I'm going to say over, but it'll probably take till um, till the latter half of uh, 2022 to get over. But I think the first part of the year is going to be a little choppy. It'll be. I think overall probably we get uh, over 10%. Uh, we don't even have to ask Andrew. We know he's bullish. No, I'm <laughs> bullish. I mean, I really believe in the, you know, the, 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 the frontier of technology and the globalization. I think the economies are booming. Like in Canada, for example, I mean, it's a very simplistic way. I mean, the city of Vancouver, I have friends working in there, <clears throat> and they are getting ready to add 2 million new residents in the next five years. You know, that's a huge boom in just this economy. And because the city has to be ready just by building infrastructure. And they're just economies are booming all around the world. And unless we get another big pandemic or a war or someone attacks someone or something like that, I don't think the economies are going to shrinking that much. And uh, that's, that's what I see. I'm very bullish. And in the last 50 years, how many years with SPY was actually negative? Like two or three years but was yeah, only negative? Yeah, you get uh, corrections. Yeah, corrections. Few years, yeah. yeah. But when you got to remember, when it corrects, it, it takes a, like if it drops by 20% and then goes back up by 10%, it takes a few years to recover. Yeah, they say uh, bulls take the steps, <laughs> yeah. bears uh, take, take the, the elevator. Yeah, take the elevator. Yeah, so like the window. So <laughs> SPY from 2002 all the way to 2011 didn't do anything. Like if you would have bought at the peak of the dock, bubble you have to wait 10 years yeah. to get your money yeah. back yeah uh, inflation of course has been a really really hot topic and we're going into next year inflation over or under five percent for the year I think it's uh, I think it's gonna cool a little bit I think it'll be under five percent I think uh, some of the some of the issues that have uh, driven inflation have been supply chain and I think we're getting we're starting to get through that uh, now so I, like I said I think it's I think things are gonna moderate and, and cool off but I still think inflation is going to run hot, uh, but under under five. Under five? I don't. I don't know actually. I really the macroeconomics. I don't know too much. But I know that uh, I've read somewhere that uh, inflation is a little bit of inflation is actually healthy for any economy. Like Japan, who yeah. had deflation, yeah. or Germany for a while, they were trying to get out of deflation. Yeah. That uh, you know, target two three percent inflation yeah. is very healthy for the economy. And that's what the Fed always tries to target yeah. a, a certain level of percentage. They don't want it to be too high, but one or two percent is where they typically want to see it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. exactly. I, we I grew up in Iran, and uh, uh, when I was growing up, we saw inflation of as high as forty percent. I think right now Iran has inflation high inflation, and uh, but most of the time was around ten percent. And it was not very dramatic, uh, you know. I saw the whole country in that time when I was growing up. The economy was getting better and better and better. Yeah. As long as there's wage growth to subs, uh, yeah, the wage growth is really important piece of. A very good point. I was reading yeah. somewhere that if you consider the wage growth and inflation, you know, the real inflation might not be seven percent as people say because the wage growth has been in last year, yeah. you know almost the same so you yeah. also have to adjust that as well yeah exactly yeah we have we have the cost pool section of inflation and then the demand stuff so if the wages are increasing it's actually a good thing for economy yeah uh, rate hikes uh, we know one of the biggest headwind for the equity market next year is the Fed and raising rates so right now they're pricing at least two rate hikes over or under two rate hikes going into next year? Um, you know, I, I think people are hedging two, maybe three. Um, yeah. I think two for sure, maybe 
maybe three again. It's uh, a lot of it's going to depend on uh, you know how we get through this latest variant and the you know reaction to the. Um, to inflation, how hot it runs. As I said, I don't think it's going to be as hot this coming year as it was last year. So, uh, you know, it'll be two or three. And I don't think there'll be, you know, you have to think of where we are right now in yeah. terms of the, you know, the interest rates. We're still very low. So, um, yeah, anyway, I, I'm, that's where I'm kind of thinking right now. I think Fed's on target to do at least two, maybe three. Yeah. No comment, no comment as long as this long swing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, I would love to hear some bold prediction going into 2020 from both of you guys. What sector do you think is going to outperform? Is there any stock that you think is going to hit it out of the park? Any specific? Uh... Um, well, there's two, there's two sectors I'm looking at. I mean, one, one I mentioned in my swing trade uh, video was uh, gold and silver. They, they seem to be, have been performing well over the last um, last week or two, yeah. and uh, I think uh, I think you may see a bit of a resurgence in gold and silver, at least into the beginning of the year. Um, certainly it's popped up a little bit, and I'm still willow for dollars. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think the pot sector actually has some potential in the new year. We've got, um, I think I think this year the, the Fed will probably, um, you know, uh, decriminalize um, Marijuana, which will open the sector up, because right now they can't, you know, use normal banking yeah. um, systems and that kind of stuff. So once once the Fed opens that up, I think there'll be some uh, some uh, impetus behind some of the some of those stocks to to catch a bid. So so in the U.S. Uh the when the states that are legal, they cannot use the normal. No, because it's a, a lot of the banks. I think are federally regulated, and oh. so they can't because it's if it's illegal federal federally, so they can't use a normal banking system. Mm. So, <clears throat> so they could be you know they operate in each state that has legalized it, but they're prevented from using the banking system because it's a federally related uh, or federally regulated um, industry. So. Oh, yeah, so <clears throat> I think there's some. There could be some ca uh, catalyst to move the the pot sector too. So go Vila. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm really bad. I'm, I'm I'm more like a day trader. I'm really bad at uh, swing trading. But I think travel sector probably going to come back. I mean, airlines were really beaten up, yeah. and airlines are in the industry that. They never go down. Even the pandemic, the governments bailed out the airlines, but they didn't bail out the car companies. Yeah. And that's why, you know, they started selling all of their cars and then after the pandemic was over, they started to rebuy all of those used cars and they, the price of the used cars went up. And I think it's a sector and industry that never goes away because it's very uh, critical. And mass tourism hasn't even started, you know. If the pandemic is over and China opens the border, uh, Chinese tourists are one of the big things that are coming because in the last 10-15 years the middle class in China has grown so much and they have money and they love to see the world and uh, I think uh, yeah I mean it's been two years that China has closed the border and if that opens up I think tourism really picks up and you know again based on the numbers mass tourism hasn't even started imagine 600 700 million Chinese that they want to go travel yeah. yeah, I think speaking to that, I think like a uh, stock like uh, I was looking at some place for next year, Boeing, which uh, I think yeah. when the travel yeah. sector comes back a lot, I think um, you know specific stock Boeing or Airbnb could be could be good as well. Yeah. Um, but those are you know Boeing's a big uh, company and it's got its fingers in. What is it trading at now? It went out as low as ninety dollars. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know. I think it's in the mid 200s. Don't quote me on that. I haven't looked at it for a while, but I was I was starting to think about you know next year's plays and yeah. So the travel sector did come to mind, and then I was thinking Boeing for uh, for the aviation industry for sure. So like a one long yeah. term, one year. Yeah, soon. longer term. Yeah, yeah I mean yeah. it's something that you know buy what, on dips. And, what do you think, Eddie? Uh, I think some of the data analytics, data cloud, yeah. those. Yeah. I mean, look at Snowflakes, look at MongoDB, because we, we're working on some tools, and of course we're using databases uh, for some of the tools we're developing for BBC. And you can see these markets are growing so fast. So I would really look into chip manufacturing, like ASML, NVIDIA, data, yeah. big data. They're really strong, the yeah. semiconductor. Really yeah, they're very, very strong. I think they're going to continue their momentum. So it'll be interesting. Uh, it's a great time to be a trader. 
Option mm-hmm. trader, day trader, mm-hmm. selling some puts on Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> Make it yeah. 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 So this year at Bearable Traders, uh, we actually build a replay tool for those of you who ha- don't know on, on YouTube. Go to stocktradingsimulator.com. It's not a real-time simulator. It's a replay on demand. Yeah. So you can go just select any stock that you want at any date and you trade it. And uh, for that, we needed to have a you know, database. And you know that was the first time that RD and I got exposed actually to a lot of these, uh, you know, um, back-end, back-end yeah. technology of these softwares and stuff. So go definitely use it, and we're going to have some really good upgrades for that uh, uh, tool. And uh, sign up. Make sure to sign up the email because Simon and Eamon are going to give you uh, the homework and how to trade. So we're going to have some really cool up- updates on that. Plus, we're building a really nice, cool uh, that we're going to probably release it by January. Uh, for traders, uh, it's some it's like a terminal, but you know we're gonna make it a surprise for you. Uh, but that was a good point about the sectors that you did mention. Yeah, the data analytics. Yeah, so we covered a lot. We covered about the year, how the indices finished. We talked about our best trade, worst trade. Um, Brian, of course, and Andrew gave some really valuable, uh, you know, tips to people who are just starting out for a strong 2022. Uh, you know, for sure, check us out, uh, like the video, subscribe. But uh, before we end, any final, final saying? Any? Yeah, I would never actually thought that this year, my the subscriber and Bearable Traders channel and YouTube become over hundred thousand, and it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. That was one of the funny uh, tweets that I saw that someone says, you know, I, I never thought that my Twitter followers become 100,000. And it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> 2022. Yeah. 2022. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, if you can subscribe and comment and like our channel, because we would like to increase it to 100,000. And uh, because that's the limit for getting a verification tick from YouTube. So that would be really uh, appreciated. But other than that, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I had a pretty good day. I mean, uh, ups and downs, obviously. Tra- I traveled a lot, and I, you know, challenged myself physically in, in some co- um, trail runnings and climbs. I did climb a lot this year, hopefully continue uh, climbing. And Bearable Traders grew again. You know, we had, uh, you know, Ed Martin join us, yeah, and nice. uh, Kyle joined us with his sessions, and uh, we had a couple of other, uh, who was, who else joined us at Bearable Traders? And, um, I'm losing my mind. Uh, anyways, Simon, yeah. of course. Simon joined us, yeah, that's added. for sure. Dima, yeah. Dima, 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 Dima and Simon. Dima, Dima and yeah. Simon, yeah. yeah. So that, that, that was amazing. We ran three boot camps at Peak Capital. This boot camp in January almost sold out. You wow. know, that's, that's awesome. It's not even January. And we, uh, we're really exciting. In boot camp, what we do, we help traders to build their trade book. Uh, working with Peter and John and Mike, plus Dima and Eamon and Simon as you know, captains and co-captains. Um, and uh, we got the office. And uh, it has been really good working in the office. You know, I, oh, you know, in the last six, seven years, I traded from home. You know, you still trade from home. Still trade it's, from home. It's, you know, it, it works, you know, for, and, but it's nice having an office too, so. I love it. I don't want to trade from home anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, you will come out this year and we trade. And in December in Vancouver, meet up with Norm and uh, Peter and uh, Thor and Ed and everyone came. We had a really nice uh, trading day here. So we decided actually next year to have uh, a meetup that maybe one or two days all the traders come and we all trade in the same room because apparently that was really good energy and people loved it. Yeah. We had a couple of big meetups. The biggest one was mm-hmm. in, um, uh, I think in Vancouver, Vancouver yeah. which and about 150, yeah. and New York for 4th of July, Thor's birthday, we had home 130, 40 people. It was wow. really fun. Amazing. And this year, continuing just expanding the tools that we have, you know, expanding the community and uh, yeah, just personally, I want to challenge myself more too. Good deal. Well, I, I you know, we've probably we've covered a lot of topics here today, and it, like, um, I don't think I can add much more. But other than, you know, 2021, I hope it was a, a good year for everybody. It was it was a good year for me. Enjoy, enjoyed it a lot, just despite the fact that I didn't get to travel very much. But um, looking forward to another 2022 with uh, Bearable Traders l- offering a lot of stuff here, a lot of training. A lot of opportunity to learn, um, mentoring, um, e- trading with experienced traders. So I think you'll benefit a lot by following us, subscribing, and uh, joining our community if you're not already. Well, yeah, and with that, that kind of brings it uh, to the end for this session. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, here's to a fantastic 2022. Right. Here we go. Uh, 
for you traders and for us and for bearable traders we're going to continue to expand can't wait for your book coming in next mm -hmm. year as well yeah it's going to be fantastic oh i know you also have a book on options that coming in yeah yeah we'd love to we'd love to get started i uh, have to start focusing lots of things going on but we'd love to get on uh, get on options as well yeah, yeah. 2022 we're going to add more publications i know brian is working on a century working on a book yeah it's uh, about 80 percent done yeah, so yeah all the best awesome yeah no. Well, Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. Hey, yes. thank you so Cheers. much, guys. Cheers. Bye -bye. Oh, it was awesome, Brian. Thank yeah. you so much. All right. Yeah, excellent. Yeah.